I'm looking at an army of people that say, we don't want business as usual. We want revival and we want revival now. We came desperate for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You can take your seat, but I want you at any moment to feel liberty and freedom to stand. You say, brother, why would you have a stand? Hype us up and then make us sit down because I want you to know that what we're preaching about today is not hype. Someone said, brother Isaiah, you just hype up God. To hype something means to make it above what it really is. You can't hype the king that is above every king. You can't hype the Lord that is above every Lord. You can't hype the Alpha and the Omega. You can't hype the God that has power and dominion over every principality and power. And so if you feel it in your bones, you can shout. If you feel it in your spirit, you can praise. If there's an excitement in you, I want someone in here to praise like the God God that we serve is not dead. Come on, Saint. It's getting quiet. Are we at St. Anthony's? Are we at Legendary Conference? Oh, there's a group of people that aren't worried about what their neighbor thinks. I'm not going to let somebody in my row ruin my flow. I came to praise God. Sit down. I came to praise God undignified. Here's what undignified means. A dignified means I don't care if my wife is uncomfortable with how I work worship. I don't care. Well, I brought my boyfriend. I don't care if my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my fiance is uncomfortable by the way that I worship. It was not my girlfriend that delivered me. It was not your boyfriend that delivered you. It was not your fiance that set you free. I'm scared. What if my pastor thinks I'm crazy? It wasn't my pastor that set me free from the bondage of atheism and alcoholism and love lust and perversion and pornography. The Bible calls it the finger of God. Jesus said, if I cast, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you right now, I just feel like I might start floating away. I, I don't know. I might start levitating in the Holy Ghost. But the Bible says that if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you know the kingdom of God has come upon you. There are many churches in America, but very few churches that God is putting Putting his finger on. Very few churches that God's hand is there. And I felt in worship the strong hand of God is in this room saying, Who wants my fingerprint on you? Who wants to be set free? Who wants to be delivered? Who's going to be the bloodline breaker? Who's going to be the one that stands for freedom in my family? I was in prayer. I, I prayed driving over here. I live about an hour and 45 minutes away. And I felt the Lord saying, I want you to pray in the Holy Ghost the entire drive. And so I put worship me. I'm already fired up. I pre-gamed. I got here ready. Like some of you used to go to the club and you drank in the parking lot because you couldn't afford. I pre-gamed. I came high on the most high. I showed up drunk on the Holy Ghost. I didn't need a worship team to hype me up. I entered into his presence with thanksgiving. Came into his courts with praise. See, we have too many Christians. The only time they worship is when a worship leader hypes them up. Oh, uh, the, wor the worship, some of you come in. The worship just didn't hit right for me. I, uh, I just didn't really like that song. I wanted to hear the new Jesus Culture, Bethel, the new Hillsong album, and I just wasn't really into the worship at that church. I'm like, yeah, you got to realize we're not here for you. I, I'm just going to give some of you a news announcement. The worship song wasn't for you. The, it doesn't, you don't have to like the worship. You know the seraphim? They've been singing the same song for a trillion years. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The one that was and is and is to come. And they go to sing a new song, but they gaze upon him. And they're struck by the holiness of God. Our God is unlike any other God. Our our God is holy. Our God is righteous. Our God is strong. So I was in prayer. I was hearing from God. 
And then I came in here, and as I walked through the door of the church, they don't know this, I heard a phrase I've never heard before. I heard the Lord say, and I'm not preaching tonight on deliverance, but by the way, when God shows up, people get delivered. Don't tell me God's in your church if your pastor's afraid of casting out devils. Don't tell me God's in your church if nobody's getting healed. The sign that God is somewhere is the demons leave. Then you know the kingdom of God has arrived. So get out of here. Stop emailing me, soft pastors. My pastor wants to talk to you. Your pastor's soft. I don't want to talk to him. I don't have time to argue with grown men about whether we should go to war or not. We as Christians, it's time to buckle up your boots and it's time to go to battle. The devil is devouring this generation, but God is raising up an army in these last days. They say, devil, you done messed up. You tell your demon friend, send his captain out. Come on. I got the power of the Holy Ghost. I was just doing deliverance a couple days ago, and all these little petty demons were trying to talk to me. And I said, send your captain out. I use Z's line from his song. I told the demon, I want to talk to the strong man. The Bible says, who can bind the strong man but the stronger man? I don't know if you know this, but Jesus is in this room tonight, not in some metaphorical, theological, hypothetical, systematic sense. Jesus is in this room by the power and through the person of the Holy Spirit. And I know, well, I brought my friend. He's been on heroin for 18 years. He's been on methamphetamines. He's been on fentanyl. I want to tell you, there is no chain that is too strong for God to break. Because as I walk through hold on hold on as I some churches I have to beg them to shout here I have to beg them to not shout as I walked through the door of the church I heard something I've never heard before I heard the Lord say tonight I am breaking ancient chains I am and I said Lord Lord what do you mean ancient chains and I realized this demons curses the devil works through generations works through lineage works through heritage works through bloodlines and comes through family lines to devour destroy to steal to kill there are many of you in this room that would say isaiah addiction is running in my family poverty has ran in my family alcoholism has ran in my family heroin addiction has ran in my family see the devil doesn't just demonize people he thinks in terms of generations there are generations after generation that grew up in Egypt that lived in bondage. But God said in a, in a time of hundreds of years of bondage, generation after generation, there had to be somebody born that was going to break the curse. There had to be somebody in that generational line that ended up at a church like this in a city named Antioch, which was the first city that Christians were called Christians. That say for 150 years, drug addiction has ran through my bloodline, but there is a new blood running through my veins. It's the blood of Jesus. Devil, get off my bloodline. Leave my family alone. Ancient chains. I want to tell somebody this. It ran into your family until it ran into you. Look at me, look at me, look at me. The devil's never met a Christian like you. You know why religious demons are manifesting tonight? They've never been in an atmosphere like this. I saw when they were speaking in tongues, you're like, where's the interpreter? You're manifesting your religious demon because you've never been in an environment where the Holy Ghost is allowed to do what he did in the book of Acts. See, we have so many churches where God is not in the church. I'm going to prove to you God's not in the churches. We have to advertise our churches. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I, I'm turning off my phone because I don't want to look at my clock. There's no clocks in heaven. So honestly, we may go till midnight. I don't know. I'll drive home at 2 a.m. I don't care. There's no clocks in heaven. Tell your, There's no watches in heaven. There's no. I don't really like worship. You're not going to like heaven. I don't like long services. You're not going to like heaven. I don't like it too loud. You're not going to like heaven. Friend, I'm telling you, the glory of God, what is better in this place than the glory of God? There are so many places where we advertise church because God isn't showing up. So when God doesn't show up, we have to manufacture and we have to make things people like so they'll actually come. And so I love the screen, but I wouldn't mind if the screen was cracked because I don't need the screen. I need the Holy Ghost. I like the laser. Well, you guys don't have that many lasers here. You need more lasers. I like all the laser beams and the light machines and the fog machines. I some churches I go to, I need to wear a gas mask. I was up in the room over there. I said, is this the Shekinah glory? Like, no, it's just the fog machine up here. It's, 
I think somebody warmed up a hot pocket before service and smoked up that whole back room. I was like, oh, I thought it was a Shekinah glory. Never mind. We have to fog up the church, laser beams, light. But I've been, in, I've been in hundreds of services. I've traveled for 13 years, and I've stood next to people that were addicted to drugs, people that were living a homosexual lifestyle, people that were in years of gross, demonic bondage, and that laser beam hits them, and they don't get delivered. That light, some of these, I mean, that, and there's nothing wrong with having it. My church has all that. Praise the Lord. But don't give me the fog and not the Shekinah glory. Don't give me the laser beam and not the beam of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Spirit. I want the punch of God. I want the, some of y'all aren't getting this. I want my service to be potent with power. We need power in the church. Come to my church. We have an attractive pastor, and he has an attractive, I'm like, I look at, when you get an interview to become a pastor, they don't care if you pray. They don't ask you, do you pray? Do you fast? Do you live holy? Do you, do you not watch any worldly movies? Do you not listen to any? You know, they ask you, what's your favorite three movies? I look at pastors' websites of mega churches, and it has their favorite movies, has their favorite this, and I'm like, Scarface? That's not a Christian movie. Is your mega... We have no reverence or fear of God in the church. And now this is what they tell you in a pastor interview. If you didn't know, let me give you a hint how far the church is. Do you talk good? Do you know how to network? Do you have a large social media following? Are you attractive? What is your style like? Is your wife attractive? I mean, we don't care about anything spiritual in the church. We are superficial, which is why we're not supernatural. We are living in a plastic, synthetic church age. But I see God raising up men of the cloth, Men of prayer, men of worship. Do I have anybody in here that says, I want fire, I want power, I want holy, I'm tired of plastic. And I left my glasses on. You guys know I don't preach with my glasses, but I'm going to preach a hole right through some of you. Is he looking at me? I'm not looking at your neighbor, I'm looking at you. You got to get tired of plastic Christianity. So because God isn't showing up, we have to advertise. We have the best children's program. We have the best LED wall. Did you see the LED wall at the church down the road? It's better than our LED wall. I mean, we have to advertise this stuff that honestly, I not, again, I love it. Our church has it. It's meaningless to God. God does not care how nice our buildings are. God does not dwell in physical locations. Now, in the, some of y'all are still living in the Old Testament. In the New Covenant, God says, I want to live inside of you. I want my power to touch you. I want my anointing. So I'm asking the Lord, God, would you break ancient chains? God, I want to be the one in my family tonight that breaks the curse. I want to be the one in the family. A new bloodline is starting. A new generation is rising. You might have brought your friend that's been addicted for years, but one second in the power. Can you all hear me in the back in the overflow? One second in the power and the glory of God changes everything. Thirteen years ago, I came in as an atheist. I was sitting in the very back mocking God, making sexual jokes about the pastor's wife. I didn't know it was the pastor's wife. I was so far. If you name a demon, I had that demon. I had every critter on board. I was literally a train that any demon could just jump on board and flow in my life. I was demonized. I was addicted. I was depressed. I was angry. I was racist towards my own race. The devil had me twisted up like an Annie Ann's pretzel. I had no desire to serve God. I had no desire to worship God. I was an atheist in a back row. But what I didn't know is there was something in that room that had called me before I was in my mother's womb. See, here's why I'm not intimidated by your drug addiction. Here's why I'm not intimidated by your anger. Oh, you can stay angry all you want. I'll preach a hole through you. I'm not angry at you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not intimidated by you. Here's what I know about you, that before you were in your mother's womb, before your parents even thought about having you, you met with God, and God put everything you need in you. Jeremiah, he said, before you were even in your mother's mother's womb. I knew you, Jeremiah. I called you, Jeremiah. I anointed you, Jeremiah. I want to tell somebody that you are not here by accident, but God has raised you up, Esther. First, I wish I had an Esther in the room. This says, I've been born for such a time as this. Why is my family so, you know, God put you in the family you're in. 
Not one of you had a choice in what family you were going to be in. Not one of you had a choice on what level of poverty or what level of opulence you'd be born into. Not one of you chose who, what color skin you were going to have. Not one of you chose what city you're going to be born into. But there was somebody that chose. And oftentimes, uh, we come into services like this and say, God, why did you put me in this messed up family? Why did you put me in a family of addicted and drug addicts and porn addicts and child molesters and rapists? And God says, because... Uh, I knew that you were the perfect one to reverse the curse. I knew you better shout for your family. I'm here praising, not just for me, but my great, 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 great grandkids. I'm praising for my great grandkids. Seven generations from now, in a hundred years, that say our dad had a revival in Manteca. He said yes to God, and our life has never been the same. I'm the bloodline breaker. Are you going to, what are you going to pass down to your kids? Now, I know some of you adults, you're too arrogant to praise. That's fine. I know some of you men, you're too arrogant to shout. It's fine. We saw you last week at the Super Bowl, and God knows how that ended. Some of you are still trying to recover from that, and you haven't been to church. Lord, if you let them win, I'll go to church every Sunday, and they didn't win, and you've been home mourning. I understand. But you've mourned longer over the loss of grown men wearing tight pants than you've mourned over the lo- your family and friends going to hell. Let me just say this. Your friends and family are lost and going to hell, and you mourned over men that lost a football game. Does not matter in eternity. The, the Niners winning the Super Bowl would not have changed anything. They don't know you. They don't care about you. They make hundreds of million dollars a year, and you do not matter to them. It's a game. It's sports. It's childish, okay? Yet here you are, still mad about it, and I'm going, when are you going to get mad that you don't have a prayer life? When are you going to get mad that there's no passion in you? When are you going to get mad? Not at me. I know you're, you're only mad at me because I'm telling you something you know to be true. But I'm, I'm mad at myself. I'm mad at myself that I've lost my spiritual hunger. I'm mad at myself that I came in this room tonight and there's no thirst in my soul. See, David said in the book of Psalms that like a deer longing for water. And this word longing, it's not just like a deer is like, oh, I'm thirsty and takes a glass of water. The deer hasn't drank in a week and says, if I don't find water, I'm going to die. And the deer is longing. It's actually panting. Panting is something animals do when they're literally on the verge of dying, of not having anything to drink, of literally being thirst, uh, thirst to death. And David said, I like the deer that's panting, saying, I need to find water. David said, when I'm coming into the house of God, there's a, there's a longing in my soul. My soul is actually panting, thirsting. David said, when can I stand before the living God? And I look at the church and say, is that the thirst that we have? I want to wake up every day saying, God, and I've been saying this recently, I'll die if you don't show up in my life. Guys, I'm convinced I'll die without God every single day. God, I can't preach without you. God, I can't live without you. God, I can't be a good father without you. God, I can't be a good husband without you. God, I can't be a good business owner without you. Somebody in this room needs to get a begging spirit. I am a beggar in spirit. I am poor in spirit. God, every breath I breathe, I need you. Apostle Paul said, I pray without ceasing. So I was driving over here praying, and something hit me. And, you know, I just got my whole sermon in the car. Who knows? I, I, something hit me. All of a sudden I said, wait a minute. This is how Paul lived his life. I'm doing this on a car ride because I have nothing else to do. And Paul lived his life. Paul said some crazy stuff. He said, if I die, it's, it's gain. I'm winning if I die. He goes, but if I live, it's Christ. So either way, you could kill me and I'll be benefiting. And if you don't kill me, I'll still be benefiting. Paul said, I die daily. Paul said this, I stay up all night long and starve myself just to beat up my body. So my body knows I'm in control of you. You're not in control. Paul, you're crazy. Like, Paul was a bad dude, and I'm looking, and then Paul says, oh, and by the way, I pray without ceasing. And he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in church, I'd rather speak in English so you understand. But hey, guess what? Outside of church, I'm praying in tongues all day, all night. Why? Because there was something, there was a connection that Paul had that the American church is missing. Closeness. Intimacy. And we're only intimate with God at church on Sunday. 
The only time we want to be intimate is at an altar or on a stage. And God says, I don't want you just intimate in public. Actually, intimacy, which I know there's kids because I can see you because I have my glasses on. Usually you all look like SpongeBob, but I actually see you tonight. There's actually kids in the room, so I'll be careful here. Intimacy in public is not very healthy. Hello? Intimacy was meant to happen in a bedroom. That is why Jesus said, if you want God, how do I get God? I'm tired of preachers. I'm tired of screens. I'm tired of laser beams. I want God. Jesus said, if you want God, you got to shut the door. You got to shut the door. What happens when I shut the door? I open up a spiritual portal into the unseen realm called prayer. I open up a vehicle where me and God are able to connect on a spiritual level and I'm able to find God on the earth. God is not in a physical location. He's in a spiritual location on a physical place and the physical place is the secret place and God wants to give us a burning desire to connect with him in the spirit. Why am I failing at life? Why does nothing work out for me? Because you don't have God. Imagine we come to, imagine going to church and getting God. When will God be enough for the church? When will we have to stop advertising all the new preachers, all the latest stuff, and we just say, hey, at our church we have God, and people begin to show up for one man and for one person. I hate to tell you, but Isaiah Saldivar can't save you. Isaiah Saldivar can't deliver you. Isaiah Saldivar can't heal you. The only thing Isaiah's ever saved, you already know, is $100 a month switching to Geico. Isaiah can't save you. It is Jesus that saves. It is Jesus that delivers. It, get connected. But there's an epidemic. We don't have God in the church, so we have to promote all these other things to pretend he's here when he's really not here. So now, it's crazy because in the book of Acts, you couldn't have a church where miracles weren't happening. You couldn't have a church where demons weren't being cast out. It was normal for demons to get cast out and miracles to happen. Now in the church, it's okay to not happen and still be called a church. So now we have churches where nothing supernatural happens, no miracles happen, and it's normal. You bring your friend in, they're addicted, they have a demon, they're on drugs, they have cancer, they're sick, and they come in addicted and they leave addicted, and they come in addicted. I did a video last night, not to plug my channel, but it's kind of going viral, of literally a church that was doing their Super Bowl performance, and they were the pastor was on a ball and chain, he was swinging, singing Miley Cyrus, and the other pastor was punting the Bible. They literally got the Bible, and they kicked it, and I put that video up, and then I put a, a video of the underground church of China receiving Bibles for for the first time, and they were weeping, they were kissing the Bible, they were crying. We have American Church Incorporated, and we have the Church of Acts. In contrast, we are so far from biblical Christianity, and the crazy part was, I my mind was blown watching this church, but you know what blew my mind was the crowd. Everybody loved it. They had glow sticks waving. The whole church, 30,000 members, packed out with people. A bunch of goats that were worshiping and screaming for Miley Cyrus and Usher. They were singing, I think it's Usher in the Club, one of those old school songs. And they were singing that in the house of God. And I was just, I was just crying going, Lord, we have defiled your altars. We have made a mockery of your name. We have turned your church into a den of thieves. God, would you turn the tables on the American church? Would you raise up Christians that would thirst and hunger? The Bible says you got to hunger and thirst, and then out of your belly shall flow a river of living water. The river doesn't come until you start getting thirsty and hungry, until you start getting desperate. There was a guy in our revival that used to crawl to the altar every single service, and the, my church members started getting mad. Well, you know, we're bringing our family, and this guy, his name was Matthew. This guy, Matthew, he'd crawl from the back, weeping, screaming. He'd literally crawl on his hands and feet all the way to the altar every single service. And, you know, the people that were too cool to be desperate and to be undignified and to be hungry, the ones that are jealous of him because they don't have what he has, they come, we have to have, you know, we, I don't know if we should have them do that every week because there's new people coming, and people are going to think it's weird and all this stuff. And then as they're telling me that, I heard the Lord say, Isaiah, remember? Remember when you were like that? Remember when you were like Matthew? Remember when you were desperate? You can sit here and be mad at the worship leader who, by the way, I don't know where he's at. That was, I've been in a thousand churches. That's one of the best worship leaders I've ever seen in my entire life. The anointing on that man, if he wasn't at this church, I would try to hire him and take him home just to film some videos with me. And hey, listen, how much are they paying you? Where are you at? I'm just saying, I want to talk to you after. I don't know. Maybe we could do some exchange. I don't know. So anointed. So on fire for God. And then so, there he, he wants to go home with me. He's like, I'm down, bro. They ain't paying. I'm struggling out here. So anointed and so on fire for God. 
And yet some of you sit back and you don't understand why he praises that way. And you're mad. You're actually bitter. Instead of better, you get bitter because you're actually jealous for what he has. And when you're jealous, Paul, in fact, Paul said, I came to the Gentiles just to make the Jews jealous to want what I'm giving them. You have to see people and get a holy jealousy and go, I want the fire and the passion that he has. I want the hard cry and the desperation. When's the last time you were broken? Why are you going home without your makeup being smeared? Some of you ladies, the first six months of your salvation, you didn't go home once without your mascara running down your face. People were calling you the joker in the house of God because they were used to you looking like a clown and you didn't care. But now you're all dignified. You're all put together. And, you know, now you're out here trying to look all cute. And God says it's time for the church to get undignified once again. It's time for every pastor in America to get on their knees and say, God, I repent. I've been lukewarm. I've been casual. I'm in compromise. I'm in compromise. We should wake up with knee pain. Man, my knees hurt. Oh, why? Because you're doing construction and tiling? No, not because I was on the roof, because I was in the prayer closet. Guys, our knees should be hurting every day. We should, oh, my knees, I got to sit down because I've been in the prayer closet. Wow, you're really in your prayer closet a lot. Well, yeah, have you seen my family? Have you seen my Aunt Lupe? Have you seen the way she acts? Have you, I got some, I'm talking about, we got some chief demons up in this family, and God has put me here not to be a crybaby, not to be a warrior, but to be a warrior for God. I am an atmosphere changer in God. I am a culture maker. When I walk into the room, I bring the kingdom of God with me, and demons get upset. Don't be worried about that coworker don't like you no more. It's their demons that don't like you. But we're going to cast those things out in Jesus' name. The normal Christian life, healing the sick, casting out devils, having a prayer. How do we survive as a church without fasting? If you don't fast, you won't last. And I'm going to look down for this one. I'm not trying to be rude, but I can tell some of y'all just haven't been fasting. I'm telling you, some of y'all, some of y'all haven't. There's no spirit. Oh, you thought because I meant you're waiting or not your weight. You're not spiritually hungry. When somebody is fasting, they're in tune with what the Holy Spirit speaking. They told the Jesus, why aren't your disciples fasting? Shouldn't they be fasting? And Jesus goes, why would they fast? I'm with them. When I'm gone, then they're going to fast. Why? Because fasting draws the presence of God into my life. Have you been distant? Start fasting. Have you been weary? Start fasting. Well, when? maybe I'll fast next week. The best time to fast is tomorrow. The best time to pray is now. Stop putting off the spiritual discipline. It is time now to go all in for God. If we were to look in the spirit tonight, some of you would be grown adults wearing floaties because you've lived for years in the shallow end of Christianity. And you think you're deep because you could recycle somebody's sermon from YouTube. You think you're deep because you could put quotes out on Instagram. Some of you ladies, I see your I see your Instagram, you have the Bible highlighted. I'm like, you don't even realize you highlighted Leviticus. You weren't paying attention. You just highlighted it to post the Instagram picture. I'm like, that was not the right spot to highlight, ladies. But we're so, so superficial and so act. We put on a show and we act like we're radical and we act like we're on fire. And I'm kind of worried we're like the church of Sardis where God says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. There's no spiritual life in you behind closed doors. There's no hunger. And God forbid we looked at our screen time. I just don't have time to pray, brother, but you have time to scroll on TikTok for eight hours a day. You have time to watch teenagers dance in bikinis while your wife's not home, scrolling away and getting all full of lust and stirring yourself up. And then you come to the house of God and no wonder you feel shame. No wonder you feel guilt. No wonder. I just don't know why I can't raise my hands because when you have 150 pound chains of perversion wrapped around your wrist, I'm telling you, God's about to break. Let me just say it this way. I put the spirit of perversion, lust, and addiction on notice. We bind every foul spirit of perversion. You will not have the men in this church. Devil, I came to tell you, all 130 pounds of me, that your reign of terror is over. Come up and out in Jesus' name. There's a remnant rising. Come on. Stop being offended. I'm offended. Stop that. Your family's going to hell. You don't have time to be offended. Start preaching to them. Start being radical. 
Start being hungry for God. Wake up in the morning and say, God, you're all I think about. I remember when I got saved, I'm so passionate on fire. Me and my wife got married. I'd never been in, in a godly relationship. I was terrible in the world. I'm not going to go into details because my, my dad's here, but I was terrible in the world. And I got married, and me and my wife were in revival when we met, in revival when we got married. And I, before in the world, we, you know, we go to the movies, we go to the game, we go and do stuff because that's what you do when you're a couple. Me and my wife, because the Lord had removed every appetite we had for the world, we had nothing to do. We're just like, well, we don't go to movies. I didn't go to movies for 10 years, not because it was bad, not because it was sinful, because I was bored. Why would I want to be at the movies if I could be in prayer? Why would I want to be at the restaurant if I could be fasting? I'm telling you, we were like, we would just sit around staring at each other. Like, I guess prayer's at 6 o'clock. Should we just sit here? I mean, we didn't have TV. We didn't, have, we didn't watch movies. We were just like so on fire and obsessed with God for so many years, the fire burning. And I believe some of you are getting ready. God is going to call you out of the culture. He's going to call you out of the pleasures of this world. God is going to so light your soul on fire that you're not going to want to go to movies, not because they're bad. And you're not in sin if you go to movies, by the way, and you're not lukewarm or less than because I'm talking about where God puts you in a level for a season where you're going like, why would I want to be on this? Instagram notification? Who cares? Where you get on and you gladly uninstall every app because you know this has been stopping you from your calling. Why would you risk standing on judgment day and this testifying against you and God saying, you want to see what stole your destiny? Imagine you're on judgment day, and you're ready to see a big demon. You're like, yeah, show me the demon that stole my destiny. Show me. It must be a big principality, and God brings and goes, no, it was iPhone 15. Software version 14.3. This is what stole your destiny. The devil's on vacation in Hawaii and has demonized an entire generation through this portal. This, friends, is a spiritual portable portal that we've opened up the gates and the portals of hell. And God needs some people that are going to raise up, that are going to push back on Satan's kingdom. I want to let you know tonight, you don't even have to shout, this one's free. You are not a grasshopper. You are not weak. You are not defeated. You've been given the keys to the kingdom. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's time to get radical because I believe this is what's stopping us from revival. The good things in our life. Distractions. Devil goes, I don't need to hook you on heroin. I'll hook you on Netflix. I don't need to get you to overdose on fentanyl. I'll get you to overdose on shares and likes on Instagram. I don't need to get you addicted to alcohol. I'll get you addicted to pride and selfies. I'll get you that Philistine spirit, that prideful spirit where you want everybody to like you and everyone to care about you, where literally the devil has connected us into the world system. And God says, you're not supposed to be like the world. You're supposed to be a pilgrim just passing through. You're supposed to be different. You're mad that you're different. Welcome to Christianity. The narrow road is still narrow. I don't care what fake plastic pastor told you that the broad road is narrow. I still believe God is raising a people that say, we are going to, I wish I had some 70-year-old that would shout me down. We are going to walk on the narrow road of holiness. Holiness is still right. Holiness is still good. Lord, remove my appetite for this world. God, remove my desire to fit in, to do drugs, to drink, and to party. And God, give me an addiction to you. Guys, I was addicted I was addicted to Four Loco. I hope, you, I hope you don't know what that was. Maybe you just got saved. I was. I was addicted. I drank every single day. And my friend's parents wouldn't even care because they thought it was an energy drink. And I'm drinking. I became so drinking all the time, drinking at work, drinking at college. I'm like, oh, college is 10 hours. I could drink twice and be sober by the time I'm done. Oh, I'm working eight hours. I could drink twice and be sober. I got so addicted. And when I got saved, the Lord removed the addiction and the desire for Four Loco and said, I'm still going to give you an addiction. I'm going to give you a new di- addiction. I'm going to make you addicted to the word of God. I'm going to make you addicted to the place of prayer. I wonder if we have any Holy Ghost addicts in this room that say, I'm addicted to his spirit. I'm addicted to his presence. I'm addicted to his power. God, I want your spirit. I'm begging you. I need you. Why? Because those that hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Let me wipe my eyebrows here. Wait, my, wait, what? Those that hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled? So... What happens to those that don't hunger and thirst? They get nothing. They become American Dry Stale Church Incorporated. There's no hunger. There's no thirst. Stop asking God to fill you when you're not hungry. 
Stop asking God to pour out your spirit. And God goes, where? You're too full of yourself. Actually, I want to pour out, but there's actually no room. Where would I go? You give the devil like 30 rooms to your life, but you've given me nothing. And then you know what's crazy? We invite God in, and we do what I do when people come to my house. I'm like, hey, I invite new people over, and I'm like, yeah, you could just stay in the living room, but don't go back in my office, my studio, don't go in my bedroom, don't go in my kids' room, because I took everything from the living room, the mess that was in my living room, and I husband clean. Y'all don't know what I'm preaching about here. My wife said, you stop cleaning, because you don't clean, you just move things. Because uh, ladies are like looking at your husband. I, I guess I'm the only one. Matt, anybody, Matt, Matt, help me out here. Am I the only one that just moves stuff around? I mean, my wife thinks I work for U-Haul when I clean the house. And I get everything, and I put it in a room, and I'm like, I'll go through it later. And so when I invite guests over, I don't really want them to go into the dark, back, intimate places in my house. I just want them to stay where it's clean. And I'm like, hey, thanks for coming for 90 minutes on Sunday. I'll see you later. And this is precisely how we invite Jesus into our life. We invite him in with our eyes closed, which I don't even know why we do that still. It's not the 90s. Everybody close your eyes. Don't let anybody see your hand. I see those hands. And we get you to pray a sinner's prayer, which, by the way, I know some some of you are like, I can't find this sinner's prayer in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Just, I'm just saying. I'm not mad that you prayed it. I'm just letting you know, don't hinge your entire salvation on repeating five words that a pastor led you to with your eyes closed and your hand up after filling out a welcome card. We don't need people to repeat a prayer. We need people that would lay everything down for Jesus. If any man wants to come after me, he must deny himself, not fill out a card, pick up his cross, and follow me. God is looking for people to be all in. But no, we don't do that. We let Jesus in the living room of our life. Jesus, we don't want you into the area of our talk. We don't want you into what we watch at midnight on our computer. We don't want you in the area of what we watch and listen to and look at. Do y'all really think when you're watching those demonic horror movies, Jesus just leaves you while you watch it and then comes back when you're done? Stop. I want to I give some of the fear of the Lord. Stop making God watch porn with you. Do you know the Bible says sexual sin is like taking Jesus to see a prostitute? The Bible says, would you take Jesus to a prostitute? And the answer is no. And then it says, yet when you commit sexual sin, you're doing the same thing. And you're harming your own body. God does not want to listen to your new uh, whatever. I wouldn't even be able to listen to it. I don't even know. Name an artist. God does not want to listen to that with you. God does not want to watch that sexual movie with you. Well, I'll just turn it off on the bad parts. Yeah, but you've turned off half the movie. If you have to keep skipping every, y'all are getting quiet. I'm hitting something. I'm drilling into a nerve. I came to do surgery. I got enough, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I don't need any more subscribers. I'm not here to try to make friends. I got a few friends on the front row, and I think they'll still be my friend after they've invited me three years in a row. Last year, I'm like, there's no shot they're inviting me back. Here I am again, so I'm not afraid of offending you. I would rather offend you into righteousness than lull you into compromise. I'd rather hate you, me, or you hate me on earth and love me in heaven than love me on earth and hate me in hell. But we're fast-forwarding every movie we watch, every song we listen to, and then whenever we turn it off, we're like, all right, Lord, I want to pray. And God's like, you're grieving me. Actually, this is what the Bible says, your lifestyle disgusts God. Have you ever been disgusted by something? You see somebody vomit, you see blood. I'm, I'm pretty weak when it comes to that. When I got saved, I was, I was studying and got a degree in law enforcement, and I saw crazy stuff, and we watched crazy videos. I was desensitized. I could see somebody getting anything done to them. didn't affect me. When I got saved and born again, I don't know what happened, but God, God resensitized me. And so now I'm like, oh, there's blood. I squ I, I'm squeamish. I ick. I think they call it an ick where you're like, oh, that's so gross when you see something gross. That's how the Holy Spirit feels when you're cursing. That's how the Holy Spirit, you're literally giving the Holy Ghost an ick when you're watching those movies and God says, I so badly want to speak to you and draw near to you, but you got to understand that you're grieving me. Like God is saying to you tonight, work with me. You're literally giving God a pile of twigs saying, build me a log cabin. And God goes, would you give me something to work with? You're quenching the Holy Spirit, pastor, when you don't allow prophecy. Well, listen, I, I'm fine with it. Again, I'm not trying to get canceled here, but I really don't care. I've gotten canceled like 90 times and I'm still here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know why I care anymore. I'm like, I don't, don't take this wrong. No, take it wrong. I don't care. I go to church like, yeah, you know, people are getting delivered. We don't want the new people to see. I'm like, what, that God's real? I give a new, I was an atheist. 
If I came to church, y'all, and saw somebody screaming, leave me alone, what do you want from me? Come on. And I saw a demon, I would have been like, oh, that's cool. That's real. The whole pastor up there faking it till he makes it, acting like one way, then I see him. I literally was partying with the, the youth pastor of the church I was getting invited to. And I'm like, wait a minute, bro, you want me to come hear you preach when last night I saw you do a keg stand? So I saw the fake. I wanted to see the real. See, we're holding back the real in the church and the, in, the, in the guise of we don't want to offend the new people when the new people are like, I'd love to see a demon cast out. I would love. Why? Because if I see it cast out of them, hey, I got some critters on board. Maybe God can deliver me. It's time to display the works of God to this generation. We have been invited in to the wedding banquet of the Lamb, but we live in the drive through of the devil. God says, I prepared a table. And you know what's crazy? If you go read the Bible, am I, I, I'm like, what, 10 minutes in? I've been preaching for, what, 10 minutes? I have five more minutes. Wave at me. Okay. 5, 10, 15, 20, 20 30, 30, 40. Okay. I got enough. 45 is plenty. The, the Bible says in Luke 14 and Matthew 22 that you actually have received an invite. Friend, you've been invited to the greatest revival in human history. It's the wedding banquet of the Lamb. It's God's wedding. And God says, I've invited you to participate in a divine marriage. And I'm reading the story and I'm going, wouldn't everybody take the invite? Like, I don't want to be the guy that gets invited last on the list. When me and my wife are doing our wedding, we're like, okay, here's the real list. And then if these people don't make it, we have a secondary list of, like, cousins we haven't talked to in a while. And we'll put them on the corner table without, like, the tablecloth. And, you know, nobody wants to be. If you got invited to a wedding a week before, you were on the second list. You were the backup. Don't expect to sit close. Don't expect to give a speech. Don't expect anybody to even look at you. You'll be lucky if your name's on the table. It's probably just going to have a, a, a question mark because we don't really know. This is just for the extra people. That is not how I want to be invited to God. That's not how I want to show up to the wedding supper. I want a first class. I want to be the first one to say, Lord. So the parable, God says, I've sent out the invites. Every single one of you that can hear me on the replay, watching online, in the lobby, foyer, what's maybe you're outside still lined up maybe you thought the service started at 9 30 and you're just driving in wherever you are you've been invited and the problem is the church has been invited to revival invited to holiness invited to awakening and we're saying no to god stop telling god no when he invites you into a deeper level i'm good in the kiddie pool why because in the kiddie pool of christianity i still make my own decisions in the kiddie pool Christianity, it's safe. I don't have to go all in. And Ezekiel had a vision of people that were in ankle-deep water, an ankle-deep river. And Ezekiel said, I saw them. They were up to their ankles. And there's many of you tonight. I'm not going to look at you too close, but you're wearing Dora the Explorer floaties on your arms, and you're 60 years old. Spiritually, you're a baby. You've done nothing for God. There's no passion, no hunger. And I know you don't like it. It's okay. Um, next week, your pastor will be way nicer, I promise. Next Sunday, there will be someone here that's like way nicer than me. And they'll tell you all about the programs going on in the back. But tonight, I'm calling you out of this because you're in the ankle deep looking for neck deep glory, living in ankle deep reality. And God says the reason why you're not catching fish is fish don't swim in one inch of water. All right. I know, I'm, I know I'm being strong tonight, but you need it this way. It's February 24th. Don't raise your hand on this part. Don't put up a number. Don't be the one that's like, five. Don't do any of that. How many fish have you caught this year? Oh, it's a silence over the crowd. How many fish have you caught? We don't catch fish. Yet Jesus called these men out of their lifestyle, and then Jesus says, here's your number one job description. You're going to start fishing for men. Oh, you're a Christian now? You're an ambassador of God? Okay, now I'm calling you to bring men into this kingdom, to bring people into this divine invitation. You are called to make disciples. You are called, and we're not fishing with lures. Lures attract only certain type of fish. The disciples didn't fish with lures. They fished with nets. Why? Because everybody's invited. White, black, poor, rich, pink, yellow. I don't care where you're from, what you're from, who you've done, what you've done. There is room at this table. This church is not a gated community. This church is open to every culture, every background. I don't care what you did three hours ago. You've been invited to deliverance tonight. You've been invited to healing tonight. You've been invited to breakthrough. How many fish have you caught? We're fishing in the wrong areas. 
I've got nothing. I've never seen anybody saved. I've never, I'm just preaching here. Just, just stay quiet and just look at me. I've never seen anybody delivered. I've never seen anybody healed. And I, now, now I know why you're bored all the time. I ma- it makes sense, Matt. I understand now. You're bored because you're not doing anything the Bible says a Christian should do. Oh, you're a fish out of water. You're like, Christianity is boring. I'd rather watch videos on TikTok of dogs jumping through hula hoops all day. How many cat videos do you have to watch? We're bored. Guys, we're so bored. We don't know true pleasure. David said, God, you give eternal pleasure. You don't realize God designed pleasure, and there's more pleasure in his presence and in his kingdom than a thousand drugs, sleeping with a thousand women, going to every club you can think of. God is my source of pleasure. God is my source of joy. But we're looking for love and life in all the wrong places. And the angels told the disciples, why are you looking for the living among that which is dead? Keep going to the club. You're never going to find life there. Keep going to the bar. You're never going to find life there. That's why when they sent, John the Baptist sent his disciples and said, should we keep looking? Or are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus sent him back and said, tell him what you've seen and heard. The search is over, friend. Look at me. Every eye looking at me in this room. The search is over. And the reason why I don't party, I don't drink, I don't have a desire for the world is not because, oh, it's sinful. Oh, it's bad. That's not what keeps me out of drinking and partying and drugs and this and that. It's because I've already found what I was looking for. I did years and years of drinking and partying and drugs and girls and money and this and chasing the career and chasing straight A's and chasing none of it mattered. I finally found what I was looking for. See, the Bible says when you find God it's like a man that finds a treasure in a field and he gladly sells everything he has to buy the field God says buy the field but we're at the edge of the cliff going to jump in the water and we're we're afraid I sat an hour one time and I'm embarrassed to admit this I think Z might have been there with me at a lake there was a large cliff well it, it didn't look large, but when I got up there, it was large. And everybody was jumping off this cliff, this rock, and I'm like, I'll do that. I'm brave. And I swam over there, climbed to the rock. And when you got up there, it's like 10 times higher than you think. And I probably stood up there. I'm not. I'm embarrassed to say it. Probably 45 minutes. This was years ago. Okay, I'm tough now. I'm 32. I got four kids. It was like five, three, I don't know, two maybe last year. I don't know. It was a long time ago. And I stood at the edge of the cliff, and I'm like, this isn't fun. I am not having fun. Why are they all laughing and enjoying this and jumping and jumping? I'm not having fun. See, the fun doesn't start when you stand there and go, maybe I'll go all in. Maybe I'll jump. Nobody almost jumps off into the water and then get, go, crawls back down the rock and says, that was so fun. It's boring. The fun part is when you actually step past the point of no return. When you go, see, once you step off that cliff, there's no going back. And when you go all the way into the river, all the way into the glory, all the way into the power, that's when the fun begins. But there's a bunch of chicken Christians that are hanging over saying, maybe someday I'll jump. Maybe someday I'll go all in for God. Maybe when I'm a little bit older, I came to tell a young person, don't forget God and the excitement of your youth, but in your youth, honor your creator. Now's the day to worship God. Now's the day to go all in. Now's the day to be radical for God. This wasn't fun until I stepped over the point of no return. Some of you are bored in Christianity because you're watching everybody surf the wave and you're letting the wave pass you by. Some of you wonder why you're spiritually out of shape because you're going to the gym watching other people exercise their faith and not you. I mean, imagine you go a year to the gym and you're, you don't look any different. I mean, if you went a year to the gym, God knows I haven't been to the gym, but if you went to a year at the gym and you didn't look any different, my question would be, what are you doing at the gym? Well, got the clothes, got the uniform, got the membership, got all that, and I just go and I just watch people. I just watch Wait, what do you watch them do? I watch people bench press for 30 minutes, and then I watch them, you know, do triceps for 30. And then on Thursdays, I watch these guys do shoulders. And then sometimes I go into the cardio area, and I watch people do the stair step. I mean, that thing looks hard. I watch people on the bike. I watch people on the treadmill. And after about like an hour and a half, I'm, I'm tired of watching them. I mean, they're working out. They're working hard. They got veins popping. Are y'all catching what I'm cooking? And they got veins popping out. They're sweating over there like Isaiah on stage. And I'm just watching hard, and I'm going, wait a minute. You don't actually participate? You actually don't exercise. Wait, so how much weight have you? Oh, I haven't lost any weight. Actually, I've gained a couple pounds because I get jack-in-the-box on my way to watch them work out. So hold on. 
do you think you're going to lose weight? Well, eventually I'll lose weight. So you think you can go to a gym where everybody else is exercising. You can watch a pastor preach. You can watch the worship team worship. You can watch the prayer team lay hands on people. You can watch the home group start. You can watch the kids group. You can watch because all you've done for years is watch. You've watched everybody else serve God. And we have this weird delusion in the church. I think it's because we have stages where if I sit down in my chair and watch the pastor preach, somehow I'm actually learn. I'm actually the one getting the revelation. I'm actually, if the only scripture you get is on a screen, you're delusional. If the only time you fast is, oh, I'm going to mess all y'all up. Sorry. I'm, I just, they told me, listen, that pastor was riding in a wrecking ball in that video I made last night. I'm actually, I'm riding a spiritual wrecking ball tonight. In the spirit, I came with a wrecking ball. I'm not talking about no Miley Cyrus trash. I'm talking about we are wrecking every stronghold in your mind that has told you you can be lukewarm and be fine. I am calling you higher. It's time to go to the next level. It's time to grow in God. It's time to go all in for God and be radical. Well, I just wanted a demon cast out of me. You got bigger issues than a demon get cast out of you. Watching spectating. And because we have stages, we teach people it's okay just to watch. It's not okay to watch. God is no longer looking for 90-minute Sunday chair warming, air condition, conditioner taking in. And listen, no more, no more just going through the motions. No more being on the sidelines. No more being inactive. I am enlisting and calling every single person in this room to the front lines of the army of God to go all in, to be radical. I'm looking for spiritual snipers and Navy SEALs that say, God, yes, here I am. Send me. I need to take my prayer life to another level. God, give me the gift of desperation. Give me the gift of hunger. God, I need your fire. And I know it's not a message a lot of people want to hear. People got up and left while I'm preaching. Great. We need extra, We need room. So if you want to get up and leave, there's an exit. It's all red, glowing. There's an exit there, exit there. We got people outside waiting to get in. If you don't like it, if you're like, I don't like this, it's too strong, you would not have liked being around Jesus. <laughs> Jesus told the disciples, you have to give everything or you're not saved. And the disciples are following him around, and they're watching him tell people that they're not saved. Rich young ruler comes. Oh, I've given this. I've given that. Have you obeyed the commands? Oh, I've, I've obeyed all the commandments since I was youth. Okay, have you done this? Yeah, yeah. And the rich young ruler looks great, and the disciples are watching. And Jesus goes, okay, sell everything you have and give half of it to the poor. And the rich young ruler, the Bible says, walked away sad because his possessions were many. Jesus did not tell him to fill out a card. Jesus did not beg people to follow him. So the disciples are seeing this, and they're going like, um, this is not good. I mean, is anybody? So they come to him in Luke 13, and they say, can anybody be saved? Because you're setting the bar so high. Jesus didn't lower the bar. Jesus said this, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many will seek to enter through but be unable to. With God, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Friend, we don't need seeker-sensitive churches. We need striving churches that would go after God, that would say, I'm going to put effort into my walk. Show me in the Bible lazy Christianity. I'll wait. Show me. Show me anywhere in scripture where people came to church for 90 minutes on Sunday, repeated a prayer, and called themselves Christians. Well, I posted a scripture on Facebook. Show me that in the Bible where God says, I want you to memorize the word. When I tell my daughter to clean her room and she doesn't listen because she usually doesn't, and I say, go clean your room, and she comes back and her room's not clean. And then I raise my voice, go clean your room, and she comes back, my room's not clean. And I say, go clean your room, and she comes back. And then I go, Justice, I've told you three times to clean your room. Why aren't you listening? She says, well, I memorized what you said. You said, go clean your room. Did I ask you to memorize it or did I ask you to obey it? See, we have a generation of Christians, you think because you've memorized the Bible, you live it. God says, I didn't ask you to memorize it. I asked you to obey the word. Obey the scripture. Deny. The first thing Jesus says is this. Man, I got so much. I literally am not in my intro. Z was like, how do you prepare your sermons? I have all these pages. I haven't gone through any of them. I'm like, I probably won't go through any of it. But I'm glad I wasted two hours this morning trying to prepare a sermon. But here we are. First thing Jesus says, here's your, here's your issue. Deny yourself. 
That's the first thing I want you to do. I know what you want. I know you want to live a normal life, and then you want God to bless your life. And God says, I won't bless a mess. In the same way you're not going to put money into a vending machine that says out of order, I am not investing into out of order Christians. I am not giving my spirit and pouring out my power on Christians that stand on the edge, on Christians that watch other people exercise their faith. I want to be like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, where the Lord says, whom shall I? I go? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, Lord, here I am. Send me. I'm available. I'm available. Worship team, if you don't get up here, I'm going to keep going. So if you, anyone in here knows how to play the keys, just go ahead and get on the keys. Otherwise, it's going to literally be midnight. Here we are. And Jesus says, I want you to deny yourself tonight. Well, I've been saved 30 years. I want you to deny yourself tonight. Actually, you're probably worse than the people that just got saved. The writer of Hebrews actually says the people that have been in church the longest, that have done the less, are worse than new people. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, you've been believers for so long. By now, I thought you'd be a teacher. Like, you've been in church. Man, I got to be, be nice, be nice, be nice. He goes, you've been in church for 30 years. You've taught nobody nothing about God. This is the year to catch fish. God says, they're shallow where fish aren't. There's knee deep where the fish aren't. There's waist deep where the fish aren't. And guys, guys, if you're a waist deep Christian, you're still half in and half out. That was actually the title of my message that I didn't get to, but we'll preach it next year. Those of you guys want me to come back in a few weeks and preach it. I mean, I have it done, so I might as well come soon. I don't know. But anyways, waist deep. You can still move around waist deep, but you, but you feel good because you're like, well, I'm half in. I'm at the Bible study on Wednesday, and sometimes I show up to prayer if I'm really, really, you know, feeling good, and the games aren't on, and the UFC's not on. I wish some of you guys would be more excited about God than the UFC. Anyways, that's another. I'm always, I'm always railing on the guys because y'all are prideful. All right, half in. You, I was going to say something nice. Half in, but I could still move around in the river. I could still kind of do my own thing, but then I still have half of me that's godly. I say, isn't that enough? Isn't it enough that I come to church for 90 minutes, which is less than 1% of my week, because there's 168 hours in the week? 90 minutes is not impress God. A God that died for you, you think he's like, yes, you did it. You showed up on Sunday. And I know it's a struggle just to get here on Sunday. The struggle's real. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I got four kids, and we all just fight on Sunday morning. The devil knows something's about to go off and doesn't want it. I get it. It's work, and you should be at church. But more than being at church for 90 minutes, the 166 and a half hours through the rest of the week, God says, where are you? Why, why do I only see you on the weekends and you only worship and you only praise and you only call out to me and then you do your, you know, your little 21-day fast in the beginning of the year, which is actually not even a real fast because it's a Daniel fast and there's no such thing as a Daniel fast in the Bible. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm glad you got breakthrough and lost weight, but it's not biblical. I'm just saying, Daniel, di- the pastor's like, you're definitely not getting invited back in the beginning of next year. We just finished our Daniel fast and we know you ate chocolate ice cream through the whole fast. All right. We want Americanized fasting, which Daniel Fast was made up by, I won't say who, a guy. But we don't want biblical fasting, so we don't get biblical results. If you don't want to do what they did in the Bible, you're not going to get what they got in the Bible. If you don't want to sell everything, you don't get Jesus. If you don't want to surrender all, you don't get God at all. He's either the Lord of all or the Lord not at all. So we want to give God 40% and God give us 100%. And God says, why would I make you a priority when you make me an option? Why would I give you all of me when you only give me a part of you? And hey, God says, I've already done the work by sending my son. I'm waiting on you now. What are you going to give? When are you going to go all in for me? So stop being like, oh, I just want to be like the woman with the issue of blood. And you're sitting in the very back ashamed of even lifting your hands. Because when you read her, she pushed her way through the crowd and said, if I can just grab onto the hem of his garment, I know change will happen. And Jesus felt her touch and felt power leave him and said, who touched me? See, God tonight is saying, who will grab on the hem of my garment? Who will be so desperate to say, I didn't come for light. I didn't come for smoke. I didn't come for an LED screen. I came to grab on the hem of his garment. I came for God to move. I need God. I need God. Hold on. Prayer team, you can line up, but not yet. Don't come up yet. Prayer team, just go ahead and line up. I need God. Guys, I can't go on another moment. 
I'm dying, and you're dying. I made a video, and the title was, I'm dying, and I made a sad face like I was actually dying. I, everyone thought I was going to be like, I have cancer. And I made a video saying, guys, I am dying. I'm standing in front of you as a dying man. And when I got up here to preach, I was sitting in worship, and God said, son, preach like it was the last sermon you'll ever preach. Because it's possible, and I want everyone to look at me here. It's possible this will be the last sermon you ever hear. You know, I go to these big churches, and they give me a time. They say, okay, we only can go 23 and a half minutes. Matt, you know what I'm talking about. 23 minutes, brother. Get it done quick. And altar call, well, how long do I have for that? Well, like probably three minutes. Because, you know, we have the coffee shop in the back, and it closes. So we got to make sure people get some coffee in. So don't go long. And I look at the countdown in the back of these churches where we're like 23, 22, 21. And sometimes I go, how would I preach if that countdown was the countdown to how much time I had to live? How would I preach if I looked at my watch and said, I only have 23 minutes left to live. How would you live your life if you realize that you're dying every single breath? Are you trying to scare me? 1,000% is what I'm trying to do. Because you've lived your life too casual. You're not scared. Of, you're not, you're not, you don't live your life like eternity is right next to you. You don't live your life like any moment you can pass away. Friend, your next breath is not promised. The Bible says only a fool plans for tomorrow. I always have a habit of saying, you know, I'll be, because I do live streams, and I'm like, I'll be live on Friday, God willing. Be like, why do you say God willing? Because I might not be live on Friday. I might be dead. Literally, I might be dead tomorrow. I don't know. I know that I have one breath, and the next breath, every breath I take is a breath closer to standing before the God with fire in his eyes. So I'm not going to waste my breath eight hours a day on Netflix because Netflix won't matter when I stand before God. TikTok won't matter. You want to know about TikTok? That's the clock ticking. As you're scrolling, tick, talk. God said, Isaiah, there's a generation that are scrolling their life away. There's a generation that are giving their life to things that don't matter in eternity. And God says it's time. I really feel this is a word from God, not for everybody, but for some of you. God's going to speak to you. I'm not, don't take it from me. If God doesn't speak to you, don't do it. There are some of you young people in this room and old people, some of you older ladies, you've been spending way too much money on your Bejeweled game, your Jim Blitz, whatever it's called. What's that game you guys play? Jewel Dash? I don't even know. The Jewel game. You buy all these. You're too much time on that. You need un God is saying it's time to uninstall the apps. Because here's the thing. I don't want to get uninstalled from God's kingdom. I don't want God to uninstall me. Well, brother, don't be afraid of God. Have you read your Bible? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I pray saying, Lord, don't leave me. I, don't, I will lose everything, but I don't want to lose his presence. I would rather lose everything I own than lose a presence. God, don't uninstall me. I'll uninstall my apps, Lord, but don't uninstall me. Don't take away your presence. God, I'm so hungry. The invitation went out. Why didn't they receive the invitation? This will take me 30 Pentecostal seconds. Why didn't, they, why didn't they say yes to God? So I'm reading the story in Luke 14 and Matthew 22, which was the first intro to my first message that, that I didn't get to. Why didn't they take the invite? It must have been something good. Maybe it was drugs. Maybe it was drinking. Maybe it was girls. Maybe it was sex. Maybe it was partying. Maybe, maybe a new drug came out. So they wanted that. They chose the world over God. And I'm reading the story, and the Bible says they said they were too busy for God. And I look at the story, Z, and I realize it actually wasn't sin. It wasn't the bad things in life that stopped them from revival. It was the good things in life that prevented them from revival. The first guy said, well, you know, I just bought some property that I need to inspect. The next guy said, well, I just bought oxen that I need to try out. And the third guy said, I can't come to the banquet. I just got married. Me and my wife are newlyweds. Isn't it crazy how we allow the things we've bought to stop us from revival? I just bought a new house, so I got to work overtime because the interest rates are 8%. I mean, I got to work overtime for the house, the boat, the car that I can't afford, so I can't show up to prayer. And you were at every prayer meeting. You were at every revival service. You're, the pastor was on your screensaver. I mean, you were all in with this church. Like, why is there a guy in your screensaver? Oh, that's my pastor. I love him. He's such a good preacher. And now you don't even talk to them anymore. You barely come in, and you only come out once a month. Why? Because now I have to work and work because I've bought things that have stopped me from saying yes to God. The second one said, well, I got oxen. I want to try. I want to try things out in the world, and God's trying to stop me from having fun. Friend, I want to tell you right now, the reason why God is keeping you from what you think is fun is because it's not fun. It's destructive, and he knows what's good for you. My daughter thinks it's fun to touch the stove when it's on. Oh, look, it's red and glowing. Don't touch the stove. Oh, Daddy, do you not love me? No, I just, it looks fun to touch it because it's glowing, but I know that it wants to burn you. I'm a good, loving father. Some of you think you can have a snake on your lap and you won't get bit. Get the snake off your lap. 
Stop defending the devil. Stop playing with fire. You can only jump over the fire. I had a friend literally in high school that was jumping over a fire while we were camping, and he thought it was funny, and we were like, bro, you can jump over it, but at some point you're going to fall in. I kid you not. He jumped over it five or six times. The sixth time he tripped, fell in the fire. Ended up in the ER with third degree burns and like half his body traumatic. Was out of school for almost a year. Why? Because you can only play in the fire for so long before you fall into it. You might think, well, I'm getting away with the porn. You're not getting away. You reap what you sow. God will judge you one day if you don't repent and turn. Turn or literally you're going to burn. I'm not kidding you. It's no game. It's no joke. Your eternity is at stake. And I know new people are here. Your eternity is at stake. There is a real hell. I know some woke pastor with blue hair out in San Francisco told you there's no hell. And God just loves everybody. God's love is so unconditional, he'll love you, then throw you into hell. Because there's no conditions to God's love. He says, you chose hell, so here, this is where you go. This is no game. This might be the last sermon you ever hear. He said, I want to try the oxen. The third person, well, I just got married. God, give me some time. But God is saying tonight, remove all the distractions. Remove everything in the way. I'm inviting you. None of them accepted the invite. And there's that famous verse, many are called, few are chosen. That verse, you know what that verse actually means? Everybody got an invite, but few people accepted the invite. So let me ask you this last question. Last question, then I'm going to do an altar call here. No hype, no emotions. How much longer are you going to hit do not disturb when God calls you? Some of you have swiped down on your life. You've turned do not disturb on, and you look at God call you, and it's silent, and you silence God every time. God, I'm not ready to answer your call. I'm going to, I'm going to say something that might shock you. There's coming a day where God won't keep calling you. Oh, I'm busy right now. I just got a new girlfriend. Oh, I see he's calling. I'm going to send him to voicemail. You listen to the voicemail and God says, hey, where have you been? I remember you, Jeremiah, and the kindness of your youth when you used to go after me in the wilderness. Hey, call me back. I've been calling you. There's still that calling at the church. I know you backslid. They haven't seen you at prayer. I haven't seen you in the secret place. There's literal cobwebs in your secret place. Hey, call me back. Oh, I'll call him back later. A month goes by and God calls again. Oh, I just got a new job. And they're working me Sunday morning and Wednesday night. And, uh, and your buddies from church are calling you. Uh, I'm just going to I'm just gonna ignore it. I'm just going to silence it. I, I don't want to ignore God's call. Because how many of you know when they ignore your call, you know because it goes right to voicemail. It's like, I never ignore the call. Don't ignore the calls. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. I'm just going to put it on silent. And I'm just going to put it down. I, sometimes I'm on Instagram and someone calls me and I silence it and I put the phone down. Because I want to accidentally answer it and them know that I've been ignoring them for months. And I, I don't want to preach at your church. You keep calling me, I'm not coming. Okay? They keep calling, calling. And, I'm silent. and then a month goes by, and you've gone years, and you know one day, you think God's going to keep calling you because he does every other day, and people at work are witnessing to you, and you know, they don't know, but you know you're backslidden. They're like, hey, bro, have you been to church? You're like, oh, I mean, and you know you used to have a deep place with God at the altar. You know that there used to be a fire in your heart, and you're convicted because you don't want to tell them that you were in the church for years. But you know what that is? That's God calling you through someone else because God can't get a hold of you directly, so he uses other people. Do you know why God's using me to call you? Because you stopped answering his calls, and God said, I got to sit you down. I got to bump the mic nice and loud, and I got to put 130 on a good day, 140 pound, half Hispanic, half Italian, doesn't use any notes, screaming with veins popping out because you've ignored my call. I'm going to preach through this little young, this, this skinny guy over here to call you. And tonight you have a choice. Are you going to hit do not disturb? Because this, guys, and I say this with the fear of God, this might be the last call you ever get. The Bible has a very scary verse in the book of Isaiah that says, call upon the Lord while he can be found, for there's a day where you will not find him. You ever called an old friend, and you're like, man, I haven't talked to this guy in years, and you call him, and it's the saddest thing. Ten years you haven't talked to him. You, have no, you don't know how to get a hold of him. You have no Facebook, Instagram, you just haven't talked. And all of a sudden it says, dur, 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 dur. what does it say? The person you've been trying to reach, their line's been disconnected. And you realize, wait, I can't reach them anymore. My old friend Jesus, he's turned off his line. There is coming a day where God cannot be reached. And the Bible says, call upon the Lord while you are still able to find him. God, I want to know you right now. 
tomorrow might not be here. It is time to take God off of do not disturb because I want to tell you that God wants to disturb your life. He wants to disturb your relationships. He wants to disturb your hobbies. He wants to disturb your addiction. If you are in this room and you say, Isaiah, I need prayer. I need breakthrough. I need to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. I need these ancient chains of addiction to be broken. I want you right now to come out of your chair and come to this altar right now. Come up here and say, I'm turning God off and do not disturb. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come up all the way, all the way, all the way. Don't stop in the aisles. Lord, I need I need you, God. And we're just going to begin to pray for you. Just begin to lay your hands and pray for them. Let the Lord lead you. If they need deliverance, let the Lord lead you. If they need healing, let the Lord lead you. If they need salvation, pray with them. Pray with them. If they need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, lay your hand on them and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This might be the last call. You're dying. I'm dying. The last call has gone out. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth tremble. For the day of the Lord is approaching. Paul said in the book of Romans, wake up. Now is the time to wake up. Our salvation, he said, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Our salvation is nearer than we first believed. It's time to wake up. Put on the armor of light and go to battle. I can name three different people that came to my service and died within a week. The last sermon they ever heard was a sermon like this where I begged them to come to the altar. I had a friend that came to hear me preach, said yes to God, look at this, said yes to God, was driving to work in the Bay Area. He just got a job at Pixar, his dream job. He was 20 years old and was texting his girlfriend and drove right off the Altamont and died. A day or two after hearing me preach, a couple days after hearing me preach, he went off the Altamont and passed away. This could be your last night. We had another young girl in our ministry came to our service and days later her cousin accidentally shot her in the head and she died. That was the last sermon she heard was a sermon like this. People are dying every single day. What is the last message they'll hear? You're called to go preach to these people. I don't want to stand on judgment day and say, I wish I would have said yes to God and went all in. Tonight, but more than getting delivered, you need to go all in for God. More, you know what's better than getting healed of cancer? Going all in and saying yes to God. The gift of salvation. Tonight, God is granting us the gift of salvation. God is saying, say yes. Say yes. Yes, God, I'll serve you. I'll give you everything. God, I say yes to you today. You're all we want, God. God, if it's holiness you're asking for, make me holy. God, if it's hunger you're asking for, then make me hungry. God, if it's thirst you're asking for, then make me thirsty. God, if it's desperation you're asking for, make me desperate. Come on, pray that. God, if it's deliverance you want in my life, then Lord, deliver me. God, if you want to do a miracle, God, I want a miracle. God, I say yes. If it's a yes you want, I say yes. God, you want me to buy the field? I'll sell everything. You know what God wants you to give up. Let him speak to you in this atmosphere. Prayer team, just pray a minute, two minutes max for each person. There are so many people that are waiting for prayer. Just one to two minutes and then go on to the next person. God will finish the work. God, if it's hunger you want, make me hungry. God, if it's fire you want, give me your fire. God, what do you want from me? God, what do you want from me? I'll give you everything, Lord. God, if it's my hands you want, here's my hands. God, if it's my mouth you want, here's my mouth. God, if it's my feet you want, here's my feet, God. Shima Robosa. You don't need Isaiah Saldivar. If Isaiah will just lay hands on me, you don't need Isaiah to lay hands on you. You need to grab onto God. You need to get God. You don't need an autograph, you need God. You don't need to grab the hem of my long sleeve. You need to grab on the hem of his garment. You need to reach out in the spirit and say, God, I got to get a hold of you, God. God, I miss you. God, I miss your sweet presence. God, I miss the touch of your word. Did our hearts not burn when he read us the scriptures? God wants to light the fire. It's time to burn again. 
It's time to burn again. I'm going to do what Romans chapter 12 says. I'm going to lay my life on the altar of living sacrifice. This is true and acceptable worship unto God. Give your body to God tonight. God, if it's my eyes you want, you can have my eyes. What a holy presence in this room. What an unusual anointing in this house. There's an Acts 19 anointing in this church. Unusual miracles. I'm telling you right now, some of you don't have an eardrum. You're missing an eardrum. God is creating an eardrum right now. I have an aunt and a cousin that had no eardrum, and God gave them a brand new eardrum. They had none. It was nothing there. Unusual anointing is in this room. Some of you need a knee replacement. There's lots of extra knees in heaven. Some of you are getting a divine knee knee replacement right now. Some of you are getting a divine hip replacement right now. Some of you, your blood is getting healed. That disease is leaving you right now. I see the spirit of death being lifted off of you now. I see the spirit of disease being lifted off of bloodlines. I see the spirit of disease lifting off of bloodlines. I see ancient chains breaking. I see generational curses breaking. Witchcraft is being broken in Jesus' name. Familiar spirits are leaving you today in Jesus' name. Jezebel is leaving in Jesus' name. Perversion, that same-sex attraction, I'm gonna be the loving pastor to tell you it's a demon. There's something in me telling me I'm in the wrong body. It's a demon. God's going to deliver you right now. There's men in this room. You have same-sex attraction and you don't want it. You've never told anybody. Maybe you're married. Maybe you have a girlfriend. You do not want to be gay. But there's a spirit there giving you these desires. And I'm a loving pastor. I'm not going to lie like all the other pastors. It's a spirit. And God's going to deliver you tonight from that spirit of perversion. I've watched it happen over and over again. Men and women who claim to be gay, claim to be lesbians, God delivered them and now they're married with kids. We command every spirit of perversion, we bind you in Jesus' name. You have no power, you have no authority, up and out in Jesus' name. Come out, you foul spirit. You have no power. Come on, prayer team, start laying hands. You have no power. Spirit of depression. Come out in Jesus' name. Spirit of suicide, come out in Jesus' name. Spirit of suicide, come out in Jesus' name. The blood is against you, Satan. The blood is against you, Satan. Come out now. Spirit of addiction. The Lord showed me in worship. There's several in this room addicted to heroin and cocaine, fentanyl. You're, 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 the Lord literally told me this in worship. They're playing a dangerous game with this fentanyl thing right now. Your next pill might be your last pill. Stop the games. You're literally playing with your eternity by doing this whole drug thing. God, what am I going to do, Isaiah? You're going to get free is what you're going to do. God's about to break the back of heroin addiction. God's about to break the back of meth addiction right now. Get ready for God to break this now. Father, I pray for every person in this room addicted to drugs, heroin, meth, fentanyl, cocaine, prescription pills. I pray, Lord, right now that you'd break the spirit of addiction. We bind the spirit of addiction in Jesus' name. We command you out in Jesus' name. Come out. Out of their mouth into the abyss in Jesus' name. Come out of their mouth and go into the abyss in Jesus' name. Come out, you foul spirit of addiction. Go. I want you to tell that spirit, leave my body. Just the drums down a little bit. I want you to tell that spirit, leave my body. You have no power. I want you to tell that spirit. Listen, that spirit's been speaking to you for years. It's time for you to talk back. You tell that demon, I am not your home. Satan, I am not your home. Come out of me in Jesus' name. Shina robo sata. Shina rabasu robo sata. 
I was recently talking to this guy. I want you to hear this. He's been waiting to get deliverance from me. And he said, Isaiah, I did a five-day fast. And on the fifth day of the fast, I was sitting there and demons started screaming out of me. And God said, I'm about to do your deliverance. He got fully delivered on the fifth day of the fast. You know what he did? He said, I can't wait for you to pray for me. I'm going to fast these demons out. I'm going to make my body an uncomfortable place for demons. You want to live in me? I'm about to make it really uncomfortable. I'm turning off the Wi-Fi. I'm taking, oh, no, no AC. I'm disconnecting the water. I'm going to make my body a place that demons don't want to be. I'm going to worship every day. I'm going to praise every day. I'm going to give God the glory. I'm going to fast. These demons only come out by prayer and fasting. God, I'm committing myself to a fasted lifestyle. The Lord says three-day water only fast for your breakthrough for some of you. Some of you are going to do a one-day fast tomorrow. There's going to be spiritual breakthrough. Some of you are going to do a seven-day water only fast. Spiritual breakthrough is going to happen. God's going to break the curse. That flesh is going to shut its mouth. Something's changing in the atmosphere. She no robo. So give me a hunger for the word, God. It's time to get in the river. God says, get out of the kiddie pool. Get out of the kiddie pool. He told Peter, you want to catch fish? Go deeper. Go deeper. Go deep in God. Isaiah, it's too much. I'm going deeper. Get the scuba gear. I'm going deeper. You're crazy. Oh, I haven't even gotten started. You know, guys, 13 years, I'm barely scratching the surface. I'm more on fire 13 years later than I've ever been. Those pastors, you're going to burn out. Just because you burned out don't mean I'm going to burn out. I am burning out. I'm barely getting started. You will not burn out in Jesus' name. You will not lose your fire in Jesus' name. It's staying this time. Last time you lost it, you stopped putting down a sacrifice. I'm putting down a sacrifice. I'm keeping the fire in my life. God, I pray that you'd show these young men you're so much more exciting than Call of Duty. Some of you have wasted years on video games. God says it's time to grow up. You're not a little boy anymore. It's time to grow up. Some of you need to break the video game addiction. You know it's true. God says, I don't want you to drop in on Call of Duty. I want you to drop into the church on Sundays. I want you to drop in on Wednesdays. I want you to drop in on Thursdays. Stop dropping into Battle Royale and start dropping into God's kingdom. Come on. Stop shouting at the UFC fight. There's a real fight. We need you men at these altars. I'm sick of the prayer meetings only being women. It's time for the men to rise up. Some of you, it's going to be an awkward drive home. Because you're going to tell your wife, sorry, honey, I've let you have the sword. It's time for me to take the sword back. January 1st, I'm not trying to be virtue signaling or self-righteous. January 1st, we made a commitment. Well, I made a commitment. Every morning, I'm going to wake up 30 minutes early, and I'm going to do a Bible study with my daughters every single morning. Not their youth pastor, not their children's pastor, pastor dad. How am I going to pastor millions of people online if my own kids don't have a pastor? So we've, every morning since the new year, we get together, my four daughters, nine, seven, five, and three, and we do a Bible study every single morning. And why am I saying this? Because God's calling you men to do the same thing. Get off the video games. I'm tired because you play Call of Duty until one in the morning. Get off the Xbox. You're 40 years old. You don't need to be on Xbox. Get off the video games, wake up early, wake your kids up, make them some hot chocolate, and say, we're going to seek the Lord every morning before school. Men, rise up. It's time for you men to start laying hands on your kids. Every night I want you laying hands on your kids and praying that God would fill them with the Holy Spirit. I have prayed for my kids since the day they were born every single night that God would fill them with the Holy Spirit. My kids will not grow up and get on stage and say, I just never had the Holy Ghost in my life. I just never had the Holy Ghost in my house because I'll get the mic after them and say, they're lying. 
I prayed for them every night, 365 times a year, that God will fill them with the Holy Ghost. And if they run from God, they, they can't run far because all they're going to know is the Holy Ghost. Well, what if they miss out? I want them to miss out. I want my kids to be sheltered and miss out. I want them to miss out on depression, miss out on anxiety, miss out on fear, miss out on suicide. Stop trying to have your kids fit in. They're not called to fit in. They're called to stand out. No, they're not dressing up on Halloween. They're standing out. No, they're not going to watch the new demonic movie. They're standing out. Well, they just want to go to the dance. They're not going to the dance. The only person they dance with is the Holy Ghost in worship. That's it. So they're not going to the dance. They're not going to the... Well, they're going to miss out on experiences. Yeah. Like teen pregnancy. Is that what you mean? Fornication. Is that what you mean they're going to miss out on? Young people, if you don't party, you will miss out. You'll miss out on anxiety. You'll miss out on fear. You'll miss out on trauma. You'll miss out on heartbreak. You'll miss out on hangovers. Yeah, DUIs are super fun. Love to get them. $10,000. Yeah, you're going to miss out on getting a DUI. You're really going to have a lot of fun in traffic school when you do something stupid and drive drunk after the party. It's time for a generation to miss out on what the world has and get everything that God has. We say yes. Will you sing that song you sang earlier? My favorite song of all time, literally. If it's holiness you want, God, make me holy. I'm butchering the song probably, but I think it goes something like that. If it's, it's what you want, God, I'm here. And we're going to praise and we're going to worship. I'm going to pray for a few people. Do not come to me. Do not grab me. Do not line up. I love you. I'm so glad. And eternity will hang out forever. If you don't get to meet me tonight, we're going to hang out forever. Meet me at the gates. And say, Isaiah, I wanted to meet you at that service in Antioch, but I didn't get to. We'll meet at the gates. I'm going to pray for a few people I feel led to. So please don't grab me. Don't line up. I'm going to pray for those I feel led while we sing this. I just want you to give everything right now to God. Wrestle God right now. Oh 